You're listening to Just a Pinch Podcast with Injector Kristen. Join me and industry experts as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the aesthetics, wellness, and fitness industries. All right. Welcome back to Just a Pinch podcast. My guest tonight has earned a really big introduction. She comes to us with over 17 years of medical experience as a cosmetic dermatologist and cosmetic surgeon. She's a graduate of NYU Medical School, a member of multiple American Academies of Medicine, American Board of Cosmetics and Aesthetic Medicine, a national trainer and speaker for aesthetic device companies. You may have also seen her on a multitude of different TV networks and programs as a medical expert. A huge welcome to Dr. Tabitha Mir. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Hi, how are you? Very good. Very good. So excited to to have you on. We've got the colors we represent. (laughs) Yes, I know. We've got the bright ones tonight, getting ready for spring. (laughs) So I was really excited to have you on tonight um, because I really personally love speaking to and learning from providers that have a really big toolbox. And I consider you to have a really big Uh toolbox. Um, And that includes a multitude of you know, non-invasive interventions such as injectables and lasers um, to different energy devices. But then you also have the ability to perform some surgical interventions and well as well. And I know that you um, kind of specialize in the more minimally invasive surgical interventions. Um, so my goal tonight is to try to help our patients understand that real transition zone from when do we start looking at kind of the next level of um, interventions that they can do a step above the non-invasives. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, you know, at the, uh, the, the core of my um, existence, I am a surgeon and I, um, I do lots of facial plastics as well as body cosmetic surgery. And I don't know um, when this happened. I think I started really young. And I think in those, in my, my early days, it was a lot more people that were coming in for non-invasive things. And I really was enjoying that aspect of it. And then something's happened over the years where the technologies have become so good that plastic surgery and aesthetics can require really wonderful results with a lot less downtime that are longer lasting. Yeah, that's I've personally seen that. I'm, I've been in the aesthetic industry for you know almost seven years now, which is you know a blip in time. But even just in that seven years, I've seen a huge change in mm-hmm. in the technology of you don't necessarily need to go through all this downtime to get mm-hmm. a great result. And I've found personally, I've had to do a lot of patient education with like, yeah, just because you weren't down and out for you know a month, it doesn't mean you're not going to get a great result. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't necessarily need that. That's to say, um, sometimes, you know, even sometimes with the minimally invasive ones, it's the same level of downtime. It's really funny because like a plasma pen, which I don't do almost has the same level of downtime as like a full face ablation. So it downtime doesn't necessarily equal better results. It just, um, it just means that that's what time you need to recover, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It does definitely does not equal the, the outcome here. Um, so one of the procedures that I really like to to recommend and refer my patients to to you for uh, is called Renuvion. Can you talk to yeah. us a little bit about that technology? Yeah, Renuvion started years ago, kind of like in the category of coagulations. We would use Bovis in the OR, and the Bovi was kind of like the, it's the same company. It's not the same technology. And then they kind of started going forward by combining heat and plasma energy, which creates this 360 degree heat. And it was used underneath the skin and people were finding that it was being used for contraction of the skin. So your skin, people think of skin tightening as um, in all different ways. Um, But the true tightening of skin is like pulling it inward. So you're pulling it back towards the muscle. So you're, you're not lifting it, you're not pulling it, but you're actually contracting it and shrinking it back towards the muscle. That's true tightening. Um, It's like air wrapping. And that's what Renuvion does. It also has a different method method of being used sub, sorry, superficially on dermal repair. So there's two ways to use it. 
subdermally for contraction, and then on the dermis for resurfacing. There are two different technologies in the same unit. And it's pretty remarkable what it's done. And I have had some insane near surgical results with this minimally invasive procedure. That's fantastic. So is I know Renuvion can be utilized uh, in conjugation with other surgical procedures yeah. kind of as an additive benefit. Um, can it also be utilized kind of as an in-between step? Somebody that's not quite ready to have a facelift or a neck lift, but they need something more than what their local med spa can offer. Oh, 100,000%. Um, Renuvion, first of all, I have to say is FDA cleared for neck lifts, as well as skin resurfacing. The results are phenomenal. I was one of the early adopters of both, and I also provided a lot of my patient photos and information to the company, not because I was being paid, because I wasn't, but because I was just getting such great results, and I was sharing it with my reps, and they were sharing it with their higher ups. The next thing you know, um, I'm being contacted to talk about it, and it was never a money situation. I was just doing it already. Yes. So I was seeing really great results. And I thought to myself, like, here I'm doing blepharoplasties on people. And I'm getting those results with Renuvion without the incisions. And people really like not having incisions. Because if you have an incision from a facelift, from a blep, from a tummy tuck, the incision has to heal. You have to worry about all sorts of like wound healing with that incision. And that is why it's very attractive. You can get really great, wonderful contracting without cutting skin. That's I'm assuming you must have um, a, a substantially decreased risk of bruising as well, since you're almost kind of, we're talking about kind of bovi like technology you must be kind of cauterizing things as you're going under the skin. As yeah, well. you're, you're really hardly any bruising. If you are bruising, it's because we're doing something else. You know, like there's some other procedure involved, but bruising is not the issue. It's really the main downtime is how puffy you are. Mm -hmm. And the puffiness is also a combination of the anesthesia that we use. It's pretty remarkable how fast you can get back to get back on your feet. Like I tell people the very next day, you should be up and walking around. You shouldn't be laid up like a tummy tuck. You can't lift. You can't move. It's mm -hmm. really painful. Um, base lifts, you know, you got to be careful. You don't want to put any tension on those wounds. Um, and with this, you don't have that. You don't, it, it's done with poke marks. There's no stitches. There's no cuts. It's pretty phenomenal what people can do now. That's fantastic. What's, um, what's an average turnaround from, or what we'll call social downtime to where somebody feels like they could likely go out and be in public without scaring anybody? Well, when you're doing your body, you can go the next day. You know, you're, you're not visible. It's not visible. If we're talking about the dermal resurfacing, it's really seven days. Um, and if we're talking about the internal contraction, it's probably 72 hours. Wow. You're, you're not going to be back to like, oh my God, normal, but it's yeah. going to be 72 hours. You could go out and comfortably just look like you had maybe um, a little bit too much drink the night before and your face looks puffy, yeah. you know, it's a little puffy. Wow. Oh, that's impressive. So kind of similar to. Um, like dermal filler swelling or, or something along those lines. Yeah. A couple of days yeah. and back to normal. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That, that I think is going to be remarkably attractive to a lot of patients these days because, I mean, as I'm sure you, you hear all the time, it's always about timing. It's when can somebody make time yeah. in their schedule yeah. in their life to have these things done. Uh, whereas a facelift or a true like deep plane neck lift or facelift that can be you know quite a while of some downtime and just mm -hmm. having to lay low and take it easy whereas this kind of fits into your your weekend yeah it's great you know i find that a lot of people aren't you know this is my biggest um kind of challenge is people aren't educated on it and people don't read and uh, they just read headlines mm -hmm. and they don't actually know what it is or people think it's the same as, and you know better than anybody, like the same, uh, the way marketing works, you get somebody like Kim Kardashian using Morpheus and all of a sudden Morpheus is trying to compete with something like our Renuvian technology. And while Morpheus is a great machine, it's not the same thing. It's not even in the same ballpark. Yes. So, you know, educating consumers on what it is because people don't understand. There's so much information out there in the form of marketing that the consumer has no idea and they don't take the time to read. And sometimes I'm thoroughly shocked that I had a lady today who 
worked in the and it works in the medical industry but she had a consultation in the morning with another doctor and could not tell me what that doctor had offered her Wow. she couldn't remember all that she remembered was oh it's the procedure that requires two weeks of downtime which I, that that doesn't narrow anything to us at all. <laughs> <laughs> so people really should do their research and just because somebody offers a procedure doesn't mean you're going to get the results. People always try and search for the recipe without understanding that ingredients don't make the results. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I actually had a conversation um, with, with an industry professional quite literally yesterday about that exact same thing, um, uh, talking about different brands of devices that are available. And all these different brands, they're ultimately doing the same thing and harness roughly the same technology. If we're looking at, for example, RF microneedling, of course, there's Right. minute differences amongst boxes, uh, but RF microneedling is RF microneedling. And you can take the most, you know, the, the highest end box of something, a device. And if you put somebody that's untrained on Yeah. that device, that device is not going to give you that result. that provider is going to give you a poor result. And Yeah. you can take somebody that is so well-trained and understands the technology and the science and the skin and what we're trying to accomplish and give them any device, doesn't matter what it is, they can deliver you the result that you're looking for. I find that so many of these procedures and especially energy devices and definitely surgical procedures It matters whose hands you're in and not so much what the brand name is on the device for a lot of things. Now, of course, there's certain technologies that do stand on their own because they are unique uh, in, in their application. But yeah, it, it really matters who is performing a certain procedure. Oh, it, it completely matters. You know, it's funny because um, I had a patient call for the staff and said, oh, I want to know how much you guys charge for Renuvion. And and I, I remember the, the patient saying something like, oh, there's a doctor on Long Island that does it for cheaper. I'll just go to that person. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, it's uh, it's. they're searching for the brand name. They're not looking at who's doing it. They just assume that if somebody has Renuvion over here, that this person over here is exactly the same. It's not the same. Take PDO threads. My biggest struggle with PDO threads is it can be the best thing you've ever done for yourself. It can be the worst thing you've ever done for yourself. Who are you going to? I have seen absolute disasters. I train people. And, and with all due respect, I have pulled people aside during my trainings and I have said to them, you need more training. Yes. One hour, 90 minutes with me on a Saturday is not enough. And then the patients don't realize, the clients don't realize they're calling an office and they're booking for a procedure that that person has probably just learned. And that's why the prices are low. Exactly. Exactly. You know, threads, uh, before I learned how to perform thread lifts, I, I was tentative to even become trained on it because you, you hear and you would read so many mixed reviews about it and, oh, Mm-hmm. patient complaints and phone calls and complications and this and that. And after I went through my training and then extended my training even more because continuing education with this stuff is so important, I don't have a lot of issues with threads. Of course, there's little tiny things that pop up from time to time uh, that are kind of out of your control. But as a whole, if you're being picky about who you choose to perform these procedures on, you you don't say yes to everybody that asks to have a procedure done. You don't need to set yourself up for failure. And threads, as an example, can be a really successful, wonderful tool to have in your toolbox. Yeah. And it's funny because there was somebody that I had just today as well that um, was it today or some yesterday. Um, she had gotten some threads done in her neck and she is not a candidate for that. A lot of, you know, submental fat, a Mm. Yeah. really just a lot of fat in her neck. She had the kind of neck that when she looked down, there was so much fat in her neck that she had like the horizontal lines Yes. and she went and got threads somewhere, which I'm, I'm like baffled. Yeah. And she came to me and said, I don't want to do threads. They don't work. I'm like, I could have told you that I would never have given those to you, but Yeah. you know, whatever she thought she was saving, 
um, in the threads, she went to somebody who didn't have the knowledge of how to tell her that they are, that she's not a candidate, yeah. you know? So it, it's really, it's, it's becoming really disposable for, for patients too. They're kind of going everywhere. They're seeing some stuff on social media. They're going to that person. They're not asking a lot of questions. They really just want to know how much it costs. Absolutely. Cost is the number one thing. They don't even care what's being put in them, um, even with, with fillers and injectables. Well, okay. Somebody comes to me for the first time. What have you had done in the past? Uh, I don't know. I, I had some yeah. injections. Do you know what products were used? No. 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 Yeah, That's no, scary. No That's scary. It's like, it's your face. That's your body. Like, this no. is your one thing. And you <laughs> imagine with surgeries. I've had people who ha couldn't even tell me what surgeries they've had done. Yeah. They literally have no idea. Like, yep. did you have tummy tuck? Oh, uh, I don't think so. Well, what's that big scar? No, that was lipo. I'm like, uh, no, nope. that was all tummy tuck. <laughs> and then one lady had a breast reduction and I would never seen scars like this before. And I, I just, I'm, I'm dumbfounded how we don't know that being said not to shame anybody what i'm trying to tell people and, and this is the biggest challenge i have is please write it down be yeah. educated on what you're going to get done don't go into a procedure and not have any idea what they're putting in you what kind of procedure procedure you're getting done what the name of the devices that they're using there's huge differences and marketing confuses everybody write it down you know you need yeah. to know what you're getting done because it's your body and if something doesn't work out or if you didn't like it then you know what to do and what to talk about when you ask for help definitely and it's so important and with with all of these procedures from the the non-invasives up through surgery, you got to ask questions. You need to inquire about the training and education that your chosen provider has in the, the procedure that you're asking them to do. You know, how many of these do they do a year? You, you know, like, are, are you going to a nose specialist for a boob job? You know, ask, you know, what do you have yeah. a specialty? Is there something that you do a ton of? What are you really well known for? And then also get second opinions, especially when it comes to surgical interventions. Uh, I typically yeah. recommend to my patients, you know, get three opinions and, you know, don't go to the one that is way out in left field um, that doesn't seem to be cohesive with general general thoughts on your, your, your yeah. concerns. So, so there's another theory to what you're saying about the second and third opinions. Sometimes if you go to a butcher shop, they're only going to give you meat. If you go to somebody who does the same thing over and over and over and over again, that's what they're going to offer you. And yeah. they're not always willing to look outside the box. And I'll tell you why. I specialize in com combinations of minimally invasive technologies. Yes, I can give you facelift. Yes, I can give you eyelid lift. Yes, I can give you neck lift. And I think those things are amazing. But I also am great at combining technologies to give you a minimally invasive lift. Sometimes I've had patients go to a um, a traditional, you know, maybe they've been in practice for 30 or 35 years, they don't want to do anything new. And they've kind of stopped with that learning curve 20 years ago. Yeah. So there's just doing the same thing. And I've literally had patients go and get medical clearance and their doctors have said to them, Oh, I've never heard of this before. And they put doubt in the patient when they're not realizing that some people stop learning and yeah. they decide they're just going to continue doing what they're doing. Um, I went to a medical conference, a facial plastic surgery conference a few months ago, and there were surgeons there who are in their sixties that have said, I don't, you know, I'm at the end of my career. Maybe they were in their late fifties or sixties. And they're like, I'm not going to learn anything new now. I'm just going to keep doing facelifts and nose jobs and eyes the way I've been doing it. I'm not interested in these new technologies. And I say that because I speak on some of the technologies I use and they're just not interested. They're like, I'm doing what I'm doing. It's working out. My patients are happy. And so just know that it's, it's complicated and confusing, but if somebody says, I've never heard of that, it doesn't work. If you've never heard about it, then how do you know anything in order to make an opinion about if it works or doesn't work? Exactly. Exactly. And in, in many of my episodes of the podcast, I always come back to ask your provider about their education and their mm -hmm. ongoing training. Yeah. Are they going to conferences? Are they attending additional trainings? Ask yeah. them, what's new down the pipeline? Every day I have no. patients in my chair asking, so what's new? What yeah. should I be looking out for? What's exciting? What's coming up in the world of aesthetics, whether we're going to offer it or not? Like what's mm -hmm. new? 
Yeah. <laughs> if your provider can't tell you, tell you, you know, what's going on and what's new in the world of aesthetic technology, they're sleeping because there's new things coming out <laughs> nearly every day. And even new techniques and new technologies. Yeah. It's funny because I'm just, I'm always going to be that person that needs to know what's coming up. And I look at technologies and I decide if I like them or not. I want to talk about Quo, RIP to Quo. Mm. Um, you know, I really had high hopes for Quo because yeah. everybody knows cellulite, that cellulite is like, you know, a, a, one of the things that just everybody suffers from. There really hasn't been anything good about it. I was really hopeful for Quo. I feel like a little bit like I will say proud of myself because I just never liked it. I didn't like it. I didn't like the answers I was getting because I ask hard questions before I decide if I'm going to bring on a new type of technology on board. I want to see all the data and I want to know why it's doing what it's doing and why the, what the side effects are. I want to know what the clinical data said. And for me, I was not happy with Quo. And I'll tell you why. Too much bruising mm -hmm. and too much staining of the skin after oh, the, the bruising. And staining was insane. And indiscriminate just randomized melting of tissue. And I remember when the reps would come to me, I asked hard questions and I never got the answers I liked. So I never got on board with it. And next thing you know, two years later, it's been, you know, it's folded as a company. Whereas uh, Av Avali is a completely different type of cellulite treatment that cuts those bands so they don't regrow and it targets them. So I really look at that. I'm just not going to bring something in because it's new. I'm dying um, to get my hands on Ovaly. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I currently uh, utilize Selfina for mm -hmm. the dimpled form of cellulite. And I see Ovaly and I'm like, oh, it's a more streamlined Selfina. It's the next generation of, you know, that type of subsision treatment. But like, it's, oh, I, I can't wait. I so yeah, desperately it's want it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that you probably have a, a little while to go before I uh, do. You're <laughs> but, 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 but you'll get there. Eventually they'll have to, you know what yeah. I mean? It really is good. Yeah. It really is excellent. I've got um, my name in the company for when they roll it out to, to more medical spa based practices. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, a great, it's a great device. There's no question. Another funny question I get, like when you talk about everything, people always want to ask how long do results last? It's yeah. like after cost, it's like the number one app question. Yeah. And it's one of the hardest questions to answer because people want to know if everything is permanent, right? Yep. Do you get that asked a lot? I get asked that Constantly. all the time. Constantly. So, okay. So we're doing my three sessions of CO2 laser. How long is it going to last? Mm -hmm. I can't give you a discreet, exact answer because you are going to continue to age despite the fact that we've done these interventions to slow it down. But there's so many different just lifestyle factors and things inborn inside of you that are going to affect how long something lasts for. It's impossible. Well, first of all, nothing's permanent. Maybe no. a tattoo, but nothing's permanent. Even facelifts, like yep. you are not going to get a permanent result with a facelift. Yep. Every single day you're going to age. And as soon as, you know, at one point, in time, you will out age the procedure. Now that could be five years, it could be 10 years, it could be 15, 20, we don't know, but you're gonna out age it. You're gonna have um, environmental factors and genetic factors that will also continue to determine how long you're gonna age. And you're not gonna get a permanent result for $500. No. It's not gonna, you know, you're not going to get permanent results. Renuvion is a permanent result. Um, it's permanent and that meaning at some point, you're going to outage it. So I wish we could figure out a new name for that. People assume PDO threads are permanent. And I tell people, PDO threads are in the category of injectables. Injectables are not permanent. I mean, you can go down the road to silicone and sculpture, but that's not usually what they mean. They, they you know, like how lip filler isn't permanent. Yeah. These are not permanent. So I've had people say to me, I want a permanent result for $1,000. Well, what do you want a permanent botched result or something? Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's something that people have to understand right off the bat. There's no such thing as a permanent result, period. Permanent means 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but that's it. And second of all, you got to understand that if you're going down the category of non-invasive injectables, there's no permanent result. I mean, what do you think about that? I mm -hmm. completely agree. Um, every you, you can, and you have to maintain, you know, and that's, that's the way that you try to keep your result 
as permanent as possible is to do your maintenance treatments. No yeah. laser or device is going to be a one and done forever because your body is going to continue to change. So yeah. you need to be realistic with the expectations of, you know, some people say, oh, I don't ever want to have surgery. You know, it's either too much money or it's too, you know, scared of downtime, scared of side effects, A, you know, ABC. Uh, and they want to just do injectables and the more non-invasive treatments. If we look at it over even a short amount of time, you are paying for that surgery with less of a result with some of these more non-invasive yeah. treatments and minimally invasive treatments. Um, so you have to really look at your lifespan of treatments that you're going to be doing. Is this something that you're trying to do? You know, you're just trying to look a little zhuzhed up for your son's wedding. And then after that, you don't care. You just want to look good for photos and then you're fine with whatever happens. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, if you are genuinely looking to take charge of your anti-aging and, and age gracefully, it's going to be a lifelong commitment. And you need to choose which procedures you are committing to for your lifetime. And a facelift does not replace some of these other non-invasive and minimally invasive procedures as well. Facelifts also, you don't have... volumize. They lift. No. You are helping yeah. remove excess skin. Some people still need fillers. They still need laser treatments. These things are often done in conjugation, even all at the same time. So when looking at a lifespan of these treatments, I think that people need to realize that it is a lifelong commitment if that's what their goal is. Yeah. I mean, if you have gray hair, you don't dye it once and it lasts the rest of your life. Exactly. That's you know, every single day your hair grows. It's, it's a, I know it feels like it's a, um, it's a part of aging for hair growth, you know? So I had a lady today who I did a facelift on turned out amazing. And that's the other frustrating part when people don't realize what their results are because yeah. their reality is sorry. The reality is not what is in their image of their results. Absolutely. Um, she's a woman in her sixties, an avid, you know, sun worshiper and came to me over the summer with a tan so dark. It was like, she was like, a, like a maple floor, you know, like dark, dark. And I looked at her. I said, first of all, I'm not touching you till you're done tanning. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, okay. So she comes back in October, her tan's gone. And we do a facelift on her. And she has all of these perioral wrinkles and sagging. That's not a facelift. Okay. So she's like, what if you just go like this? And she actually went like this. She pulled her face back. She's like, what if you do this? I said, think, just take a look at that. How does that look? Do you really want to look like you had your face pulled back like this? Exactly. I said, the facelift turned out amazing. But guess what? You have a lot of very damaged, broken down skin over years and years of sun exposure, you're going to need, a, you know, and I gave her some secondary treatments, but that's something mentally, she just probably figured, oh, I'll wait till I'm a certain age and get a face if it'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. And that's not how things work. No. Um, and also skincare, sun exposure, smoking, weight loss, weight gain. So it, sometimes the frustrating part is their Im image of what they think they want or will get is not reality. Absolutely. And you can do your best, you know, six ways to Sunday to try to set a realistic expectation for somebody. They'll look you straight in the eye and be like, yes, I understand what you're saying and I'm on board. And then they come in for their follow up and they say, I don't see a result. Mm -hmm. And we take our after pictures. We compare it to before. I was literally talking to a provider about this earlier today. Last week had somebody come in. I don't see a result. Very upset after doing some laser resurfacing treatments pulled up her befores, looked at the afters, and her results were so good that I actually asked her to sign a release so that we could utilize her photos in marketing. Yeah, I've had the same thing. <laughs> and I told my entire, I totally understand. I told my entire staff, don't even think about coming to me because they go in, they check in the patient, they take the photos. And I tell my staff, don't even think about coming in to tell me that they're not happy with their results until you have pulled up the before and after photos. Yeah. Because 99% of the time, they'll see something and they always say the following, oh my God, I forgot that's what I look like. Exactly. And that's happened time and time again. And the same exact thing happened with a woman's neck. She said, I don't see any results. I show her her results. They were so good that the company wanted to use her photos for before and afters. Yeah, Crazy. exactly, exactly. And sometimes, especially when it comes to these kind of slower growing collagen stimulating procedures that can take six plus months to see a final result. Those results are coming in so slowly and incrementally 
that for somebody looking at themselves every day, they're not seeing that wow, aha moment of a quick before and an after. So it truly takes those photographs to be able to say, hey, this is where we started. And now look at where we are to yeah. really see that impact. Cause it's just, it can be so slow going that it's, it's tough for them to see. So I have my, um, my hubby here and I want to, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny cause we're talking about before and after photos. We're talking about that. He is, he's somebody that I throw my before and after photos and he always has, um, cause he's, he's not from the industry. And sometimes I'll show him a before and after photo. I'll be like, I feel like it's so obvious and he doesn't see the before and after. So sometimes showing them to him like, to gives me some perspective over what yeah. people are looking at who aren't in the industry. Absolutely. Cause it's, I mean, it's very true. Not everybody has that aesthetic eye and can look, I'll, I'll show people be like, okay, well let's look at the millimeters of, of your eyelid. That's now showing that wasn't showing. They're like, huh? You know, like they just, some people just can't see it, but that's a, that's a great thing to do is to kind of have your, everyday person kind of take a look and see if they can see it as well. And that's what I try to tell Tab is I'm trying to look at this from a dummy's perspective. <laughs> um, so if I see a before and after, like she had a before and after and then the af the after this lady was wearing a, a bandana on her head. And I said, my eyes are just going to the bandana. I'm like, wait, where was the bandana on the before? I'm, I'm not even seeing the results. And so I said, hey, can you do it again and just crop in on this? Can you point an arrow at the bridge of the nose? Yep. So I guess from 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 the, the outsider's perspective, talking to you beautiful clinicians who are so talented at what you do, um, sometimes we do need a little arrows pointing and a little guidance here and there. And yeah. uh, Absolutely correct. Yeah. And my boyfriend actually told me the exact same thing. I showed him a before and an after of a thread lift that was like, knock it out of the park home run. And he's like, yeah. yeah, he's like, but what if you put some little arrows to point at like the jowl and see like, that's what we're looking at the before the after we're looking at like now where our whole vectors look different. And by adding those things in, it allows people to be like, oh, that's what they're looking at. <clears throat> True. Well, that's and what's better. And, and and Kristen, I want to give you a little advice. If your boyfriend gives feedback on your before and afters, <laughs> I told Tab, she's gotten upset with me. Why can't you just say I did a good job? I'm like, <laughs> you did a good job. I just want you to be able to communicate what a good job you did to the masses. So I'm going to give you honest feedback because that means I really do care and I love you. If I just said, oh, yeah, that looks great, blah, 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 you know. Sometimes I can't. Help it, though. There was a lady who came in who in her before photos, she had she didn't wear any makeup and she had really bad acne. And as a result, post inflammatory hyperpigmentation scars. And I couldn't I, there's nothing I could do about that because on the on the on the flip side of it, because I think that before and after, I think I was looking at her acne so much that it was hard to know and understand what I was really looking at. But yep. So so I was explaining to him in that case, I, I'm not going to retouch the acne because then people are going to know that it's a retouched photo Agreed. and then they're not going to believe the, the results. Yeah. So I just kind of point arrows to, it and I'm just like, that's just her skin. Cause the result was, it was a thread lift actually. And it was such yeah. a great lift, but I wasn't going to go in and retouch her acne because then people are going to assume I'm retouching photos. Totally. You know? Totally. All right. I'll let you ladies have that. All right. Thank you. But sometimes I don't listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> We you know what, but it, it is, <laughs> it is a really good reminder, uh, you know, to, cause it's, it's with our patients, we see it when they say, I don't see it, or you show them a before and an after picture that we feel is a really obvious thing that we're looking at and they still struggle to see it, that we have to remember that not everybody has that aesthetic eye and are looking at the specific parts of anatomy. That, that also, it's, a, it's about reality versus expectations, you know, yeah. people social media and these filters oh my have God. made our jobs so hard yes i have had patients when i go on their social media i don't recognize them 100%. because they don't look like that in real yep. life they have filtered themselves to the point where it's unrecognizable yep. and then they come to you wanting to look like that mm -hmm. and it's just not possible no, no. People just, want the glassy under eyes and not a pore on their skin. And it's like, if I, 
we can't make you look filtered. If you want to look filtered, use a filter in your photos. But like, it's unrealistic to think that that is what you are going to walk around in your daily life looking like. Absolutely. You have to understand that the filters are a way to manipulate a photo that's one dimensional. Yeah. It has no way in any shape or form uh, translated to real life. Absolutely. And another thing that I like to point out to a lot of, and it's mostly my, my younger patients, but it it applies to everybody is they see these over and sometimes over treated. So over injected add filters, potentially Mm -hmm. add surgery onto it, just in a complete overdone look. Yeah. But you add these filters on and you put it on social media and people think that this is like a normal thing because people are just, you're seeing it so much. So it's become a normalized look, but they're not seeing these people in real life. Mm -hmm. And I explained to them that if you see these, these people walking around in your daily life, your eye is going to be drawn to them for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Your eye is going to be drawn to them because it looks clownish and not because they look elegant and beautiful. So all these online filters that, you know, young girls can become obsessed with, it's so out of touch with reality of what truly is beautiful in, in the world. Yeah, we've lost our um, um, ideal of symmetry and balance yes. and overfilled face. And I'm so grateful that people are starting to catch on to what an overfilled face looks like. Yes. I have never, ever been that person that overfills. Yep. Um I don't perform, I, I don't call them liquid facelifts. Like if you want to be volumized, and get volume and contour and definition and structure. That's one thing, but I don't call them a a liquid facelift. I find that people are getting, especially in England, holy moly, they are getting insane amounts of filler in their face, like 12 mLs, which is 12 syringe routinely. Their jawline for women, you get six mLs, which is six syringes. um, And it's nuts. And people think filler lifts it'll volumize and that volume will give you a three-dimensional you know filling in of your face but filler is too soft to lift anything Mm -hmm. you know and you have to be able to do it in a way that's artistic that mimics the bone also do you remember that one video of the of the influencer who had jawline filler but then he went like that oh yes and the line of filler stayed yep Yeah, that is a terrible, terrible technique. He went to somebody who had no idea, yep. looked at their face and just kind of like filled it in like it was caulk, you exactly. know, and doesn't, didn't encounter, it didn't take into account the natural movement of the face. The face moves in many directions. You can lift up like this, but you're going to be moving your face forward every day when you talk and when you eat, yep. you know, when you laugh. So there's two directional, three directional movements to the face. You have to understand that when you're doing something on somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the jaw lines, the chins, the, just everything just so overdone and just, I mean, it was, it's on, it was heartbreaking to watch. And I'm so glad to see that those trends are finally starting to fade and the general population is realizing how ridiculous it was because it's also just really unsafe to have that much gel sitting in your face compressing on structures and and creating inflammatory responses and immune responses it's not safe well we're the first generation i know i'm the first generation of like the doctors doing the fillers and when we first started like it was like how much can we put in squirt 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 you know we put a ton in we were doing lips like three cc's we're doing faces and then all of a sudden we're like oh my god this looks crazy Mm -hmm. um and the stuff migrates and, you know, Juvederm, you put it in your lips one year and you're, you're going year after year after year. The Juvederm that was here two years ago is now up here. Yeah. It's not dissolving as fast as we think it is. Um, we're using too thick of fillers under the eyes and too thick of fillers in the cheeks. So we, we were amongst the first of those doctors um, when I started that were doing these injectables because they were new. They weren't, we, we didn't necessarily learn them in our residency. They kind of came upon a fellowship or afterwards. And then I learned along the years that less is more because that stuff, that stuff doesn't leave like it says it's going to leave. Absolutely. It sticks around for years, years longer. That doesn't mean you get the result. It just means you get the mess 
Exactly. <laughs> it's like exactly. the residue of the filler is left behind. Yep. And and now and you know, people have come to me with these these insane faces and I tell them I'm not gonna do it. I said that's not my aesthetic. I had one lady who had cheeks done and she's like, Well, what do you think they look like? I'm like, I don't shame her for getting it done, but I let her know what you like is not my aesthetic. Absolutely. That is not how I inject cheeks. Yep. But if you like it and you're aware and you're uh, fully informed, then who am I to say that that is incorrect? I just don't particularly like doing that aesthetic. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I, in general, have a more natural aesthetic. And the longer that I am in the industry, honestly, the less filler I inject. And I right. Mean, That's what happened. Yeah. I just, you know, when I first started, you know, you're taught by one modality and you're like, oh, okay. So more, let's keep doing more. Let's keep doing this. We can do this. And then you just start to, your, your brain changes and your aesthetic eye changes. And you, you just start to sit back and think this doesn't make sense. And so now the experience, like, the experience is what changes yeah. you because you can look at a patient and then you see them five years later you have five years and then you've seen what happens and then yep. you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not doing that anymore. Exactly. You know? And like I inherited a lot of, of patients from previous injectors who during that time, just more, 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 more. And, you know, then I was a new injector at that time being like, how do I manage this? And like, I need to get comfortable saying no and having tough conversations with the, some of these women who have been being injected here for, you know, 10 plus years. And now I'm coming in and saying, Hey, I think we need to do some dissolving. And mm -hmm. with that dissolving, now we have to back up and do all these other, it's, it's hard. And especially when some of these women have been walking around for over a decade like this, it's what their new normal is. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand what their face actually looks like to the outside world. They're only like in their own head about it. Yeah. Truly. So, I mean, I know that my own mantra of, of kind of how I choose to treat always starts with skin health first. It's let's improve the quality of your skin with at-home skincare products, because that's what's touching your skin every single day. And then let's get your skin as healthy as we can and do these energy modalities to increase your own natural collagen and elastin, help with scarring and hyperpigmentation and make your skin look clear and healthy. So if you have clear, healthy skin, nobody's eyes are going to be drawn to a small little wrinkle or a slight little, you know, loss of volume in an area. You don't need to look perfect. If mm -hmm. you look healthy, that's what people truly care about. And I think mm -hmm. that judicious use of injectables is going to, I'm, I always tell people, I'm going to undertreat you. If anything, I'm always yeah. going to keep you undertreated because I can always bring you back and we can add more. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't want anybody seeing you on the street for the first time to be able to point out what you've had done. Also the gym analogy is what I use. You can't go to the gym and run 30 miles in one day and expect to go from a size 16 to a two. Exactly. It doesn't work in the same capacity. You can't go to your doctor or your healthcare practitioner and say to your nurse, Hey, I want you to inject me with 500 cc's of filler so that I look X, Y, it doesn't work that way. Your exactly. skin can only expand so much. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of swelling involved. There's things like bleeding, bruising, swelling, a hundred percent of people are going to swell. Yeah. And if you're swollen, I can't, figure out after a certain amount, what's swelling and what's your anatomy. Exactly. I mean, I know it's swelling, but I'm not going to inject more. So that's why I get so dumbfounded by people who will inject three cc's of filler in one sitting into a lip. I don't understand. I genuinely don't understand it. I really don't. I mean, and it's I also a rarity that I'll even put a full cc into somebody's lip in one session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's a great, it's a great blessing that people are catching on, you know, yeah. these Russian lips where it's like flattened these, um, they, you know, that's taken directly after come talk to me in two weeks once it's flattened out and looks like, you know, and like does, what's that, going on with the, the taping. Oh my God, please. <sighs> that's like the worst, the worst, the best worst idea is it like, taping the lips is. out. Like, like what are you doing? You're, it's like taping it and then you come off, it'll, it'll go away, you know? Mm -hmm. No, it's crazy. It's, it's, if you're getting good lip filler done, you shouldn't need an external support system to no. prevent you from getting complications and poor outcomes. It means that the procedure is not being done correctly. It just means people are distorting natural anatomy. Think about how much, okay, maybe if you didn't move your lips ever, 
Yeah. And you got the filler done and you actually didn't move your lips, yes. didn't talk, didn't eat, didn't chew, didn't move your lips. It could probably remain that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not going to happen. No, it's completely <laughs> unrealistic. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. No. I think that patients need to educate themselves more. They shouldn't just read headlines and they should know what questions to ask. Yeah. And for God's sakes, if the price is right, go for it. But don't pick just based on price. No, no, don't group on your face. You know, don't just... It, it's literally, it's your face and mm -hmm. horrible things can happen when it goes wrong. You know, mm -hmm. it could be life changing in the worst ways possible with dermal mm -hmm. fillers. You can permanently use, lose your vision. You could have a stroke. I mean, it, horrible things can happen. You can become disfigured. You can have skin and tissue death and permanent nerve damage from some of these things. You need to really be cognizant about who you're choosing to have these procedures performed by. And if somebody is cheap, guess what? You know this, they're cutting corners somewhere. Exactly. So they're using diluted product. Yep. They're using expired product. Yep. They're using fake product. Mm -hmm. There's something there. I had a patient send me a, a photo. She went with her friend to a hotel room where a Russian woman uh, injected them with items that were sitting on the top of a dresser in a plastic Dixie cup, you know, those cups. Yeah. And it was the syringe inside a cup Whew. and the cup was filled with some kind of milky fluid. And this woman was getting butt shots from whatever was in this cup. Oh my and God. I saw the photo and I said, please tell me you did not do this. She's yeah. like, I went there with the intentions of possibly doing it. But then when I saw what was going on, I thought, no way. I'm like, but your friend did it? She's like, yeah. I'm like, my God. And it wasn't like it was a bargain. No. She still paid $5,000 for oh fake, gosh. God knows what, probably caulk, probably biopolymer. Probably. That's that's yeah. awful. When, uh, let's see, it was several years ago in my area, um, I had uh, somebody reach out to me who had gotten lip filler injections by a nursing student in her kitchen um, using $25 filler ordered online from China and reused boiled needles and syringes being laid out on a uh, towel. And she kitchen. went through with it? Went through with it. And the the girl ended up with lips so infected that they were just self-rupturing and draining she's lucky she didn't infect and end up with something that's not treatable uh you know? exactly exactly you know? so you can like you can you can treat an infection there's some things you really can't treat like do you did you do you remember hearing of the place that was reusing prp needles yes and gave their patients hiv yes that was in the it was like arizona or new mexico or something yep that's disgusting yep and that's not to mention that unethical and sometimes people are like what kind of doctor would do that what kind of nurse would do that well they aren't doctors and nurses Exactly. You didn't ask those questions, you know, people that are money hungry uh, and in this for the wrong reasons and looking to cut corners on every, every aspect of it. And a scary part of the aesthetics industry is there's not a lot of actual regulatory oversight in these facilities, mm -hmm. health department, state check-ins. It, it depends a lot upon what state you're in. Oftentimes it's the wild west and a free for all, and you don't know what's going on behind people's doors. Yeah, it's it can be terrifying. Um, I mean, look at the nursing schools in Florida that were giving out fake licenses. Yep. What is that? And it's not that they were giving out fake licenses to people who went to their schools. They were giving out fake licenses to people who never took a day of class and were just buying a license. Paying them exactly. So, buying a degree, crazy. Yep. And it, it happens. There's doctors, nurses, PAs, NPs, you name a medical professional, and I'll show you somebody who has a, a, a purchased fake diploma and degree. And it unfortunately happens. And there's also people that are just completely unlicensed and aren't even pretending to be licensed that are performing these procedures as well. Uh, there's yeah. tattoo artists and permanent makeup artists and medical assistants and ultrasound technicians that are, are convincing people that it is okay for them to have these procedures performed by them. 
just, you know, at that point, I just blame the consumer. Yes. I, I, I have to tell you, I just blame the consumer. There's there's a point at which you can you can't even blame the people doing this no, anymore. It's it's 2023 at this point. I mean, aesthetic medicine is not new. It's it's all over the the media. People that don't even get things done know something about it. Mm-hmm. It should be pretty obvious that somebody should not be injecting something into you. You probably know that that person isn't licensed. You probably don't care because yeah. you're, you are in there for a, a bargain or a deal. Maybe you really wanted filler and you decide you're going to go to this place that has a nursing student that's boiling needles and that's fine with you. You know, I have this talk with my staff because we sometimes see some crazy stuff, um, you know, and I, and, and my staff say, says things all the time, like what kind of doctor would do that? Like, it's not a doctor at this point. The consumer is very well aware of the yeah. fact that it's not a nurse. It's not a doctor. It's, it's just some person who yeah. somehow managed to order the stuff off Amazon yeah. and treat you. And you're aware of that. Like your doctor's not I don't know. in a hotel room. I, mean, I know. As simple as that. And I don't know how badly you need to have something to go down that route. Yes. And unfortunately, people do it every day. And there's always going to be somebody there that's ready to take advantage of those people as well. Yeah, exactly. It's a two way street at that point. It is. It is. It's uh, personal ethics and business ethics, for yeah. sure. Excellent. So um, my last question for you here tonight is, uh, where do you see the aesthetics industry heading in the future? What do you think is coming next for us? Um, I see some great things. I see some scary things. I think that the thing that we just talked about, about people getting into it that probably um, aren't as trained is going to continue. I also see a lot of people going into nursing PA just so they can do aesthetics yeah. because the reimbursement on regular healthcare is not good. And I find that really terrifying. Yeah. I joke around with some of my, my colleagues. I'm like, if you ever have a heart attack, there's going to be nobody there to help you, but they can give you Botox, you know, <laughs> it's, so true. Uh, it's crazy how many people are, t- are pivoting because there's the money's better in aesthetics yeah. and that's going to make it more saturated and make it more confusing for the consumer. It's also, the- I mean, it's, it's scary to think of somebody getting into this area of medicine, having zero experience in any other area and yeah. training with medicine. Yeah. I get phone calls and text messages uh, every day of people asking if they can shadow me, if they could follow me. Mm-hmm. And I say, you don't have any kind of license. You aren't trained. You can't shadow me, you know? Um, but the, on the flip side of the good side, the positive is, you know, I've just seen so many wonderful technologies happening, giving you wonderfully really damn good results. Like I, I did my, had my ablations come back to today. One of the ladies I did two weeks ago, and it looks like I gave her, uh, I mean, I had given her a facelift in the past, but this was like phenomenal. Her skin is flawless. I did not give her a, um, a facelift. I, sorry, I didn't give her a blepharoplasty, but it looks like I did no wrinkles around her eyes, skin smoothening. And so I'm looking at the technologies going forward as becoming more and more, um, innovative and excellent for achieving those surgical results without surgery. And I have met a lot of these R and D people and they are pioneers, you know, uh, they really look at things so uniquely and they're creating the most amazing things. And that's what I'm excited about down the line. That's super exciting to, to look forward to. And yeah. I mean, it's, it is truly such an amazing industry to be a part of and to watch grow and it's just ever evolving. And I love it. I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to the future of aesthetic medicine. Uh-oh. All right. Is this wrapping up? We are. <laughs> oh, can we, can we have a little fun, like get to know Dr. Mir personal oh moment here? I mean, I have a list of 20 <laughs> questions I can pull up. <laughs> Oh, I've oh I've got one already, and you're gonna see this one blush. <laughs> oh, it's no. gonna turn the color of our shirt. Oh no! Let's hear it. All right, you ready for it? There we go. There we go. Reaching in my pocket. Oh, oh my there God. we go. There's Doctor Mir <laughs> from a uh, postcard when she was on the TV show The Singles Project on Bravo. Oh my God! I and love it. found this clean. Whoa! <laughs> so I was cleaning up recently. I found this. So this was a dating show that she was on, on Bravo, obviously before, you know, 
all this happened. Uh, and uh, here we go. Dr. Mir, seeking a man who's tall, has great bone structure with a Nordic look, like Alexander Skarsgård. And he has to be funny, sarcastic, and secure, too. Oh, my God. Oh! <laughs> He found it the other day and he's like, oh my God, you just described me. I was like looking at it like, if I had known when I wrote that, that it would be like forever in print for the rest of the world to see, I probably still would have wrote it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's so great. <laughs> All right. So for everybody watching and listening, you can find Dr. Mir at mirskin.com, M-I-R skin.com. And on Instagram at Tabasum, T-A-B-A-S-U-M. And I will put links in the show notes below as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh my God, thank you. I've been looking forward to this for a while. We finally were able to make it happen. Yes, I know. We first chatted about it kind of before the holidays. And of course, like forget doing anything around the holidays. So oh. I'm so glad that we could connect and, and have this conversation. Me too. Absolutely. Keep doing your great work. I mean, oh, I love you, you as well. too. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Just a Pinch podcast was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Kristen Gemma.